live from San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit 2018. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks here in San Jose, California. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, James Kobielis. We're joined by Peter Smales. He is the Vice President of Marketing at Imanis Data. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Thanks Cube, for having me, glad to be here. So you've been in the data storage solution industry for, for a long time, but you're new to Imanis. for a while. What, what made you jump? What was it about Imanis that? Yep, so very, very easy to answer. It's a hot market. So essentially what Imanis is all about is we're an enterprise data management company. So the reason I jumped here is because, if I put it in market context, if I take a small step back, I put it in market context, here's what's happening. You've got your traditional application world, right? On-prem, typically RDMS-based applications. That's the old world. New world is everybody's moving to microservices-based applications for IoT, for, for customer 360, for customer analysis, whatever you want. They're building these new modern applications. They're building those applications not on traditional RDMS, they're building them on microservices-based architectures built on top of Hadoop or built on NoSQL databases. Those applications, as they go mainstream and they go into production environments, they require data management. They require backup, they require uh, backup and recovery, they require disaster recovery, they require archiving, et cetera. They require the whole plethora of data management capabilities. Nobody's touching that market, it's a blue ocean. So that's why I'm here. And Imanis, as you were saying, is sort of the greatest little company no one's ever heard of. You've been yeah. around five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, company's, the company is not new. So, the, so the, the thing that's exciting, as a marketeer, what's exciting is that we're not sort of out there just pitching our wares, untested technology. We have blue chip, we're getting into customers that, that people would die to get into. Big blue chip companies, because we're addressing a problem that's materialist. They roll out these new applications, they've got to have data management solutions for them. Um, the company's been around five years, and I've only been on about a month, but what that's resulted in is that over the last five years, what they've had the opportunity, it's an enterprise product and you don't build an enterprise product overnight. So they've had the last five years to really gestate the platform, gestate the technology, prove it in real world scenarios. And now the opportunity for us as a company is we're doubling down from a marketing standpoint, we're doubling down from the sales infrastructure standpoint. So the timing's right to essentially put this thing on the map, make sure everybody does know exactly what we do because we're solving a real world problem. You're back up and restore, but much more. When you lay out the broad set of enterprise data management capabilities yes. that Manus Data currently supports in your product portfolio and where you're going, uh, how you're going in terms of evolving what you offer. Yeah, that's great. I love that question. So think of us as the platform itself is this highly scalable distributed architecture. Okay, and so we scale on multiple, and it'll come directly to your question. We scale in a number of different ways. One is we're infinitely scalable just in terms of comp you know, computational power. So we're built for big data by definition. Number two is we're very, we scale very well from a storage efficiency standpoint. So we can, we can support very large volumes of storage, which is, which is a requirement. We also scale very much from a use case standpoint. So we support use cases throughout the life cycle. The one that gets all sort of the, the attention is obviously backup and recovery because you have to protect your data. But if I look at it from a life cycle standpoint, our number two use case is test dev. So a lot of these organizations building these new apps now, they want to spin up subsets of their data because they're supporting things like CI, CD. Okay, so they want to be able to do rapid testing Develop and such. Develop DevOps and so yeah, forth. Yeah, DevOps and so forth. So they need test dev. So we help them automate the process and orchestrate the process of test dev. Supporting things like sampling. I may have a one petabyte data set. I'm not going to do test dev against that. I want to do 10% of that and spin that up and I want to do some masking of personal, of private to PII data. So we can do masking and sampling against that to support test dev. We do backup and recovery. We do disaster recovery. So some customers, particularly in the big data space, they may, they may for now say, well, I have replicas, so some of this data, it's, it's, not, you know, it's, it's not permanent data, it's transient data, but I do care about DR. So DR is a, is a key use case. We also do archiving. So if you just think of data through the life cycle, we support all those. The piece in terms of where we're going is that what's truly unique, in addition to everything I, I just mentioned, is that we're the only data management platform that's machine learning based. Okay, so machine learning gets a lot of attention and all that type of stuff, but, but we're actually delivering machine learning enabled capabilities today. Now we so. discussed this before this interview, you, there's a bit of like anomaly detection. There Correct. How, how exactly are you using machine learning in terms of what value does it provide to an enterprise data administrator to have ML inside, inside our platform. tool? Great question. The way, very specifically, the product we're delivering today, yeah. essentially there's a capability in the product called ThreatSense. 
Okay, so the number one use case, as I mentioned, is backup and recovery. Yeah. So within backup and recovery, ThreatSense, what it will do, with no user intervention whatsoever, what it will do is it will look, it will analyze your backup, uh, your backups as they go forward. And what it will do is it will learn what a normal pattern looks like across like 50 different metrics, the details of which I couldn't give you right now, but yeah, essentially a whole sure. bunch of different metrics that we look at to establish, this is what a normal baseline looks like for you or for you kind of thing. Great, that's number one. Number two is then we look and constantly analyze, does anything, is anything occurring that is knocking things outside of that, creating an anomaly? Does something fall outside of that? And when it does, we're notifying the administrators, you might want to look at this, something could have happened. So the value very specifically is around ransomware, Typically, the way you're going, one of the ways you'll detect ransomware is you will see an anomaly in your backup set because your data set will have changed materially. So we will be able to tell you. Because somebody's holding it for ransom, is what you're saying. Correct. That's so they might have, they might the have lost. Something's going to happen in your data pattern. You know, You've it's going lost to, it's data that should be there. Correct. Or whatever it might be. It yeah. could be that you lost data. Your change rate went way up or something. There's yeah. any number of gotcha. things that could trigger it, and then we let the administrator know it happened here. So we don't, today we don't then turn around and just automatically solve that, but to your point about where we're going, we've already broken the ice on delivering machine learning enabled data management. In that this might case indicate around you want to checkpoint your, your backups to like a few days before Bingo. this was detected. So at least you have, you know what data is most likely missing. So yeah, I understand. So Bingo, that, that's yeah. exactly right. Now where we're going with that is you can imagine having a machine learning power data management platform at our core, yeah. how many different ways we can go with it. When do I back up? What data do I back up? How do I create the, you know, the optimal RTO and IRPO? From a storage management standpoint, when do I put what data where? There's all kinds of, the whole library science of data management. Yes. The future of data management is machine learning based. Mm. There's too much data, there's too much complexity for humans to just be able, you, you need to bring machine learning into the equation to help you harness the power of your mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. We've broken the ice, we've got a long way to go, but we've got the platform to start with, and we've already introduced the first use case around this, and you can imagine all the places we can exciting. take this going forward. So you're the company that's using machine learning right now. What, in your opinion, will separate the winners from the losers? When, in terms when of the vendors or in terms of the customers? In terms of, well, in both, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, well, let me answer that two ways. So, well, let me answer it sort of the, the inward outward versus how we are unique. We are very unique in the sense we're infinitely scalable. We are a single pane of glass for all of your distributed systems. We are very unique in terms of our multi-stage data reduction and we're the only vendor that's doing, from a technology differentiation standpoint, we're the only vendor that's doing machine learning based stuff. So we've multi-stage data reduction. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. break that out. What does that actually mean in practice? Sure. So, we get the question for it's you. Is that compression and deduplication? Is there something else in there? There's a ratio. There's a couple different things actually. So the, why why does that matter? So a lot of customers will ask the question. Well, by definition, you know, NoSQL or Hadoop based environments, it's all based on replicas. So I don't need yeah. to back things up. First of all, replication isn't backup. Okay. So that's lesson number one. No. Point in time backup is very different than replication. Replication replicates bad data just as quickly as it replicates good. When you back up these very large data sets, you have to be incredibly efficient in how you do that. What we do with multi-stage data reduction is one, we will do deduplication, so we'll do, you know, we'll do variable length deduplication, we will do compression, we will do erasure coding, but the other thing that we'll also do in there is what we call, we've got a global deduplication pool, so when we're deduping your data, we're actually deduping it against a very large data set, so there's value in, this is where size matters, so the larger the data set, your data's all secure, but the larger the size of the data that I'm actually storing, the higher percentage I can get of deduplication because I've got a higher pool to reduce against. Yeah. So the net result is we're incredibly efficient. When you're talking about petabyte scale data mm -hmm. management, we're incredibly efficient to the tune of 10X, easily 10X over traditional deduplication and multi-X over, you know, or over technologies that are more current, if you will. Um, so back to your question about the, so we are confident that we have a very strong head start. Our opportunity now is we got to drive why we're here, because we got to drive awareness. We got to make sure everybody knows who we are and, and how we're unique and how we're different. And you guys are great, love being on theCUBE. From a customer standpoint, the customers that are going to win, and this is sort of a cliche, but it's true, it's like the customers that best harness their data are the ones that are going to win. They're going to be more competitive, they're going to be able to find ways of being differentiated, and the only way they're going to do that is they're going to make the appropriate investments in their data infrastructure, in their data lakes, in their, you know, in their data management tools so that they can harness all that data. Where do you see the future of your Hortonworks partnership going? Hmm. So Hortonworks is, so we support a, a broad ecosystem 
So Hortonworks is just as important as any of our other data source partners. So we are, you know, where we see that unfolding is they're going to, we play an important part in, we feel our value, let me put it that way, we feel our value in helping Hortonworks is, as more and more organizations go mainstream with these applications. These are not corner cases anymore. This is not sort of in the lab. This is like the real deal. You know, this is mainstream enterprises running business critical applications. The value we bring is you're not going to rely on those platforms without an enterprise data management solution that delivers what we deliver. So our value there is we can go to market. There's all kinds of ways we can go to market together, but net net our value there is that we provide a very important enterprise data management capability that's important for customers that are deploying this in these business critical environments. Great. Very good. Um, as the as more of the data gets persisted out at the edge devices and the internet of things and so mm. forth, what are the challenges in terms of protecting that data, backup and restore, deduplication and so forth, and to what extent is your company, as I manage data, uh, to be addressing those kinds of more distributed data mm -hmm. management uh, requirements going forward. Do you see that on the horizon? Are you hearing that from customers? They want to do more of that in more of an edge cloud environment? I or is that way too far in the future? I don't think it's way too far in the future, but I think that I do think there's an inside out. And so, so my position on that is it's not that there isn't edge work going on. Yeah. What I would contend is that the big problem right now from an enterprise mainstreaming standpoint is more getting the house in order, just your core house in order from, you've moved from sort of a traditional four wall data center to a hybrid cloud environment, maybe not quite as edge. Yeah. The combination of how do I leverage on-prem in the cloud, so to speak, yeah. and how do I get the core data lake in the case of, in case of, in case of the Hortonworks, how do I get that big data lake sorted out? You're touching on, I think, a, a, a longer discussion which is, you know, do you bring compute, you know, where, where is the analysis going on? You know, where's the data going to persist? You know, where do you do some of that computational work? So do you, do you, you get all this information out at the edge. Does all that information end up going into the data lake? So do you move the storage to where the, where the lake is? Do you start pushing some of the lake function out, out to the edge where you have to then start doing some of the, so it's a much more complicated discussion. I, I know we had this discussion over lunch. This may be outside your wheelhouse, but let me just ask it anyway. We see more uh, at Wikibon, I cover AI and distributed mm. training and distributed inferencing so that edges are capturing the data and per, more and more there's a trend toward them performing local mm -hmm. training of their models, their embedded models from the data they capture, but quite often you know, edge devices don't have a ton of storage and they're not going to retain that long right, term. Right. But some of that data will need to be archived, will need to be persisted in a way that, you know, in a, in a, in man, and managed yep. as, a, as a core resource. So we see that kind of requirement, maybe not now, but in a few years time, distributed training and persistence of that data, protection of that data, becoming a mainstream enterprise requirement, yep. where AI and machine learning, the whole pipeline is concerned. That's, like I said, that's probably outside you guys, Will, that's probably what, outside the- The what only thing I would add customers. to- but only, That kind of thing is coming out as the likes of Hortonwork and IBM and everybody else is starting check. to- look at and implement containerization of analytics and data management out to all these micro devices. Yes, you know? and I think you're right there. And to your point about the, the we're kind of going where the data is, if you will, in volumes yeah. kind of thing, and that's and it's, it's going that direction. And frankly, where we see that happening is, that's where the cloud plays a big role as well, because there's edge, but how do you get to the edge? You can get to the edge of the cloud. Yeah. So, and again, we run on AWS, we run on GCP, we run on Azure, we run, so, to be clear in terms of the data we can protect, we've got a broad portfolio of, you know, a broad ecosystem of, of Hadoop-based big data, you know, data sources that we support as well yep. as NoSQL. If they're running on AWS or GCP or Azure, we support ADLS, so we support Azure's data lake stuff, um, HD Insight, you know, we support a whole bunch of different things, both from a cloud standpoint as on-prem, which is where we're seeing some of that, some of that edge work Great. happening. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Yes, thanks for having me. I look forward to being back sometime soon. <laughs> we'll have you. Thank you both. When the time is right. <laughs> cool. Indeed. We will have more from theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks just after this. <laughs>